you took a lot of pictures and have a very long history. Thanks. Hello there, pair of peeps, and welcome to another episode of Our Haunted Travels. I am your host, Sean Donnelly. And I'm your co-host, Mary Ann Donnelly. Doing a little something different in this one, folks. This is research photos, but we're also going to include the history of Mount Vernon. That's right. It's a long history. It's all the way back to the 1600s. If you are into the paranormal, history, and forensic type videos, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ding that little bell, so that you're sure that you're going to hear from us next time we put out a new video. She's right. This is a long one. She went all the way back, way back to the beginning of the plantation, George Washington's plantation, Mount Vernon. And we have hundreds of pictures from our trip to Mount Vernon. And you even took some of them I away. I weeded them down. So we're going to combine the history and research photos. First time we've done this mm -hmm. in this one. So hopefully people don't get confused, but we're enough said. You guys, this is pretty cool. If you want to know about the history of Mount Vernon, it doesn't match up to the pictures, but we're going to show you the pictures we took when we were in there, and audio is the history. Okay. So if you stick around to the end, we'll come back and wrap it up. Here we go. Mount Vernon, or the home of President General George Washington, sits along the Potomac River in Fairfax, Virginia. Mount Vernon was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1960 and is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It is still owned and maintained in trust by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and is open every day of the year, which would make our president quite pleased, as in 1794 he wrote, I have no objection to any sober or orderly persons gratifying their curiosity in viewing the buildings and gardens about Mount Vernon. Though no architect is known to have designed Mount Vernon, some attribute the design to John Aris. Others say Colonel Richard Blackburn. But most believe that the design of Mount Vernon is solely attributed to Washington alone. Today, if you visit, in addition to the mansion, visitors can see the original reconstructed outbuildings and barns, including slave quarters, an operational blacksmith shop, and the Pioneer Farm, as well as the final resting place of George Washington himself. The current property consists of 500 acres and the mansion and over 30 outbuildings. The mansion has been fully restored by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, independent of the U.S. government with no tax dollars expended to support the 500 acre estate or its educational programs and activities. The first floor of the mansion contains more formal parts, including dining rooms, parlors, the central hall, and of course, Washington's study. The second floor includes six bedrooms, including the Washington's personal bedroom. The third floor includes a number of rooms that were used for storage and living space, and it also provides access to the cupola. The heights of the areas are all different though, with ceilings that vary in height, with an average of, on the first floor, 10 foot nine, while on the third floor, it's reduced all the way down to seven foot three. There's also a full cellar, which was used for a variety of purposes and was divided into several rooms. One room of the cellar, closest to the kitchen, has a large fireplace and was used as a dining area for the housekeeper and other white servants, as well as to heat food before it was served to the Washingtons. 
From the cellar, it appears that the center section of the current house is made up of the early house, which was constructed by John Augustine Washington in 1735. And this early house appears to have stood on sandstone foundations that are still visible in places yet today. As it's currently configured, the basement consists of several rooms arranged to the west of the passage that runs approximately three quarters of the length of the east exterior wall. At the south end of the passage is a single large room that occupies the entire space. There are three arched vaults that lead off the basement passage to the east, extending beneath the piazza on the back of the building. On the plans for the house in 1774, there were three smaller spaces also shown, dividing the room on the west wall as well. But these rooms are not there today. Structural evidence does indicate that they were constructed along with a staircase which connected the basement to the lobby adjoining Washington's study on the floor above. A 22-foot deep brick-lined well is also set into the floor on the north room of the basement, and it was used at different times to keep ice and store other food items. But the mansion you see today is hardly how it began. In fact, when three-year-old George Washington lived on the property for the first time, there was already a house built there, but it only had four rooms. The Washington family, however, owned the property a long time before that. It all began back in 1674 when John Washington, the great-grandfather of President Washington, and his friend Nicholas Spencer obtained the land that Mount Vernon sits upon today. The land was originally known by an Indian name, Epsawasan. When John Washington died in 1677, his son Lawrence, George Washington's grandfather, inherited his father's stake in the property, and in 1690, he formally divided the estimated 5,000-acre estate with the heirs of Nicholas Spencer. In 1698, Lawrence Washington died, leaving the property to his daughter, Mildred. On 16th of April of 1726, she agreed to a one-year lease of the estate to her brother, Augustine Washington, who just happened to be George Washington's father. A month later, though, the lease was superseded when Augustine purchased the property for 180 pounds. Augustine built the original house that was on the site in around 1735. This was determined by tree ring data that shows that the trees used to frame the section of the house were actually cut in 1734. The original stone foundations still partially are visible in the present house's cellar, and this shows that the house would have been a two-roomed home with two rooms on the bottom level, and then we know that it also had a half story above which was also separated into two rooms. By the way, when he first moved his family to Epswasson, he renamed the land Little Hunting Creek Plantation. In 1738, Augustine Washington set up his eldest son Lawrence, George's half-brother, on the family's Little Huntington Creek tobacco plantation. At that time, he moved his family back to Fredericksburg in 1739. In 1739 then, Lawrence, having reached the age of 21, began buying up additional parcels of land from the adjoining Spencer land properties, and he changed the name of the estate. See, as part of the new American regiment of the British military, he served under someone named Admiral Edward Vernon. When he returned home, he named the estate after his commander. Now, he may have made some changes to the house during the time he was in ownership of the property. We're not sure exactly what, but there is a stone tablet or a cornerstone that is carved with the initials LW. The date and significance of the tablet are not exactly known. In order to preserve the fragile stone, the original tablet has been removed and replaced with an exact copy. 
The original, however, is on display on the property in the museum. Now Lawrence died in July of 1752, and his will stipulated that Mount Vernon should go to Sarah, his only living child. His widow should live at Mount Vernon for the remainder of her life, and after her death, this would fall to his half-brother George if his daughter had no children. Now Lawrence's widow, Anne Fairfax, soon remarried and moved out, and following the death of Anne, Anne Lawrence's only surviving child in 1754, George, as an executor of his brother's estate, arranged to lease Mount Vernon that December. In 1754, when George Washington began residing at Mount Vernon, it was a 3,000 acre estate and had a house that approximated 3,500 square feet. In 1758, Washington began the first of two major reconstructions by raising the house two and a half stories. The roof was raised to create a full second story and a third floor garret. He left the footprint of the original first floor largely intact, but reconfigured the staircase and the second floor rooms. In addition, one story extensions were added on the north and south ends of the house. Washington modified the exterior of the mansion in this reconstruction to make it appear that it was made of sandstone blocks. This was done through a process called rustication, which is a technique that makes wooden houses appear to be constructed from stone by beveling edges of the siding boards to resemble individual blocks of stone. The siding then gets painted and sand is thrown onto the wet paint, creating a rough stone-like structure. In rusticating the building, Washington both preserved the original house that his father had built and made it appear to be more substantially built and a more expensive house. He also added a passage in order to improve circulation in the new reconfigured space in the basement. This caused some of the stone foundation to be replaced by bricks. Upon the death of Anne Fairfax in 1761, George Washington succeeded the remainder of the interest and became sole owner of the property and inherited it outright in 1762. The second expansion that he did was between 1774 and 1776. Before George Washington began construction, he made a drawing showing how he intended the west front of the mansion to look. The drawing showed the facade as completely symmetrical, with the front door and cupola in the center and windows balanced on either side of it. The door and cupola, however, in the actual house do not align, nor are the windows symmetrically placed. This is a result of stairs being put in during the 1758 restoration that pushed the door to the north and a window to the south. In this second construction, Washington had wings added to the north and south ends. He also added a cupola and a two-story piazza overlooking the Potomac River. First, the two-story addition was added to the south end of the house. It contained a study for Washington on the first floor, small service spaces on either side of the study, and a bedroom and dressing rooms for himself and Mrs. Washington on the second floor. This was completed by 1775. The North Wing was started in 1776 and its interior, however, was not completed until around 1787. The North End was expanded to include a large two-story entertaining space called the New Room. The earlier closet extensions were removed when the construction of these wings began.
exciting for us today is that the south and north additions to the mansion were built right up against the outside of the 1758 house. Now you may be thinking, so? But what makes this so exciting is that the 1758 siding was not removed, and so the original rusticated siding and its sand paint has been protected for over 230 years and is still visible in some of the crawl spaces of the house today. In addition, we can see evidence of second floor doors that led to porches on top of the one-story closets that were removed in the 1774 construction. And the piazza roof? It covers part of the original shingles of the east slope of the roof. That left behind preserved shingles that are virtually brand new and even have their original red paint. In 1778, the cupola was added to the roof, and in addition to its aesthetic function, it also functioned as a ventilator. With its windows open, warm air could be pulled up and out of the house while drawing cooler air in through the windows on the lower floors. Now sitting on top of the cupola is a weather vane that sits on its own large wrought iron lightning rod. George Washington commissioned this weather vane while he was residing over the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. In his order to Philadelphia architect Joseph Rakestraw, Washington specified that the weather vane should have a bird with an olive branch in its mouth. Rakeshaw constructed the weather vane from copper with an iron frame and a lead head. Unfortunately, due to air pollution, the original dove of peace, as it's been called, has been permanently removed. This happened in 1993. And today, a replica rests in its place, and the original weather vane is on display in the museum on the property. With his final constructions, this increased the mansion to 21 rooms with a square footage of 11,028 square feet. And by his death, Washington had purchased more acreage and was now a 7,600 acre estate. Following his death in 1799, under the ownership of several successive generations of the family, the estate progressively declined as their revenues were insufficient to maintain it adequately. After George died, the estate passed to his wife Martha Washington, but after her death in 1802, George Washington's will was carried out and the largest part of his estate, including his papers and Mount Vernon, were passed to his nephew, Bushrod Washington, and he and his wife then moved to Mount Vernon. Bushrod Washington did not inherit much cash and the farm's low revenues left him quite short. He was unable to adequately maintain the mansion. And following his death in 1829, ownership of the plantation would then pass to George Washington's grandnephew, John Augustine Washington II. After he died in 1832, his wife Jane Charlotte inherited the estate and her son managed it. Upon her death in 1855, John Augustine Washington III inherited the property. As his funds also dwindled, he could do little to maintain the mansion or its surroundings. He suggested to the United States Congress that the federal government should purchase the mansion. But due to upcoming war, they pretty much paid little attention to his request. By the way, he also tried to get the state to purchase the mansion. That didn't work either, and all the while, the mansion's decline continued. In 1858, Washington sold the mansion and a portion of the estate's land to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which under the leadership of Ann Pamela Cunningham, paid the final installment of the purchase price of $200,000 on December 9th of 1859, and it took possession of the building on February 22nd of 1860. It then also first opened it to public for a price that same year.
On December 19th of 1960, Mount Vernon was then designated the National Historic Landmark and the National Register of Historic Places listing. In 1869, the Mount Vernon's Ladies Association received some compensation from the United States government for loss of admission fees while the Union forces curtailed boat service to Mount Vernon during the Civil War. But it didn't quite come in the form of cash. It was actually given to them in the forms of repairs. A spiraled staircase was built in the garret, possibly to support a sagging ceiling and the cupola, as well as to improve access to it. Entry to the floor of the cupola was enlarged and much of the early framing, plaster, and lath were removed and replaced. Now in 1885, Harrison Howell Dodge became the third resident superintendent of the estate and he oversaw the estate for 52 years, during which time he doubled the facility's acreage, improved the grounds, and added historic artifacts to the collections. He also reviewed George Washington's own writings about the estate, visited colonial era gardens, and traveled around the world to see other gardens dating to the Georgian period. He also oversaw the restoration of the site and put in place a number of improvements that Washington himself had planned but had never implemented. Charles Wall was assistant superintendent from 1929 to 1937 and then was resident superintendent for 39 years himself. He oversaw remainders of restoration of the house and planted greenery that was consistent with what was used in the 18th century. In 2006, two new buildings were opened that allowed for additional background on George Washington and the American Revolution following a $110 million fundraising campaign. Development and improvement of the estate continues today through archaeology and restoration projects, which prove quite insightful about the days when George Washington lived and added to the estate. As of today, and for the foreseeable future, Mount Vernon remains privately owned properties. It is maintained through charitable donations and the sales of tickets to tour the estate, and of course, goods sold to visitors. Again, she went way back, but trying something a little different. Some cool pictures in there. Very cool place. And a lot of history. I don't think you left anything out. All right, folks. Hey, until next time. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And happy hunting. Let us know if you like this video by hitting that thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, support our channel by hitting that subscribe button thing in that bell so you get notified the next time there's a video from Panic D Video. Thanks for watching. Happy hunting. <laughs>